Hello. Um, as Louisa said, I'm Heather Richard, CEO of Transversal. Um, and I want to talk a bit about my own journey. Um, I actually started out as a Cambridge academic about 20 years ago to where we are now, but then also talking about why diversity matters in, in, in business success. Um, some of you could be thinking, okay, yeah, female CEO standing up there, you're going to be talking about gender diversity. But actually what I want to talk about is um, what I'm going to refer to as cognitive diversity and, and how that matters to, to business success. And it goes back, I guess, to my own academic background, although I'm CEO of a tech company that looks at artificial intelligence and natural language search capabilities. Um, my academic background is actually all in the arts and humanities. So, so I did degrees in English and philosophy with, with minors in French and music. Um, I then came to Cambridge University and did an infill in European literature. Um, I started a PhD doing comparative studies between uh, French post-colonial literature and Native American. <laughs> and, and while I was doing that, I had a friend who actually, he was one of the co-founders of Transversal, and this is back in 2000, um, who said, well, you're doing kind of English stuff. You can obviously write. Why don't you come and try to be a technical writer? And I thought, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give that gig a go. So I actually stopped working on my PhD to do technical writing for Transversal um, almost 20 years ago. And so it was me doing technical writing. I was sat next to another woman who was working on a degree in astrophysics. She was a technical writer too. Um, our web developer was actually a linguist who did all of the comments in his code in Italian and nobody knew what the hell he was <laughs> going on about. He, 20 years later, we still find some of that code, you know. <laughs> um, as well as, uh, you know, quite, quite a few people, obviously, with, with math, math and engineering background. But it was that small team of people that I think really allowed us to punch above our own weight at the time as well, because we were such a diverse group of people with such different backgrounds that kind of just fearlessly and, and probably quite naively, to, to be honest, went ahead to, to try to develop this company. So a lot of people will talk about... Um, STEM, and we've heard a lot about STEM, and I, I want to kind of broaden that out slightly to STEAM. Um, I think it's really important that we don't forget about the role that the arts and humanities play w within that, that sort of ecosystem, um, because it's the cognitive diversity. It, it's the different ways that different people go about solving problems that can actually make a huge difference in terms of business success. And that's something that I've definitely seen materialize over the last 20 years of me being a transversal. Um, so, so it's not just you know gender, cultural, educational, but cognitive diversity that's really key. Um, and I think part of that is, be, if you're looking at innovation, um, a real source of innovation is obviously creativity. Well, well, the definition of creativity is to be able to, to draw connections and see similarities between things that are really disparate. And so if you automatically approach everything from silos, particularly with education, you're, you're doing everyone a disservice, um, which is why I want to stick that A in there. You know, my, my father always said that the more that you knew about it in terms of you know, education, the more jokes you could laugh at. Well, I'd, I'd also put out there that actually the more you know about, the more problems that you're going to be able to solve as well. So how do we create these environments in which people within our own organizations feel like they, they can bring their whole selves to the table? And I, there's been a few speakers today that have talked about that. But I think it's really important to, to actually think about leadership um, and any of us that are in positions of, of leadership, um, whether it's running teams, businesses, etc., cetera, um, and think about how do you create a world and an environment that people want to belong to. And a few people have talked about encouraging people to bring their whole selves in, into the office. And that's that I'm really passionate about. You should not have to be a different person outside the office than you are inside. And, and in most cases, people do have other parts of their lives that they really enjoy sharing with, with their colleagues within the business. But, but that just adds to the interesting dynamics and team building opportunities as well. I, I think what that also allows you to do is look at the difference between making stuff and then the making stuff that people want. Right now, because things are changing so rapidly, whether you look at tech, whether you look at politics, whether you look at the economy, and the more ideas you have around the table, the more equipped you're going to be to actually deal with those changing market forces. It's going to um, actually accelerate the process in which you're able to innovate, even though you may be slowing some of the other processes <coughs> down, as, as people were talking about. So there's a guy who's actually won the Nobel Prize two times, um, and in two different areas, chemistry and then peace. 
Um, so a real polymath. And, and what he said, and I thought it was really interesting, is the best way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas. The way that you get a lot of ideas that aren't very, very similar is to have people that are approaching the issues with different backgrounds, different ways of solving problems, different academic backgrounds. We've talked about gender, we've you know we've talked about race and sexuality and all those things. But, but it all goes into the mixing pot and it's that multiplicity of diverse ideas that, that is actually gonna fuel innovation. So most of you probably have heard of Mark Cuban. He's a tech investor, entrepreneur, sort of in, on the American version of Dragon's Den. And what he was asked in an interview where he thought the, the biggest um, or the, the most prominent role going into tech, say 10, 15 years, he sort of said flippantly, poets. But he was actually kind of serious as well. Because what he was saying is, look, right now there's such a proliferation of big data. There are computers out there that can do the number crunching. Um, but what you need are people that are actually going to be able to add a different perspective to, to the data that's out there, to be able to spot patterns that the computers may not. There is actually a medical university in New York I was reading about. He's actually hired graphic designers and artists to work in their data teams because they're able to spot data patterns that the computers can't, and they're doing it visually. And it could be something as bizarre as, okay, you, you have all of this data, you're gonna actually put it graphically in front of you, turn it upside down on its side, and see what that tells you. Um, there's a woman called Megan McGrath who actually works as a design researcher at IBM. Um, she actually was editor of a poetry journal in her previous life. And I think what she says is really interesting in that by bringing those same skills that, that she brought from editing literature I into the workplace, what she's able to do is say, you know what, you're actually you're paying attention to the same things that matter to everybody a as humans. Um, you're identifying themes and tr trying to communicate something about that. Now, that idea of communication and narration is really important in sales, in marketing, in product development. Because you can have the best tech in the world, but if you cannot communicate the application of that tech to the audience, you are dead in the water. So if you have people in those teams who are good narrators, who are good storytellers, that's going to create business success. Um, I think uh, Uber just recently hired somebody who, who's sort of the new, new brand ambassador. And what she said is, no, actually, I'm chief storyteller. That, that's the way that I view my role. So innovation does happen when you have diversity and a difference of opinions. So at Transversal, when we're creating teams for projects, you try to t make sure that the people that you're including are bringing to the table the blend of the scientific, the artistic, the rational, emotional, the macro, the micro. And that may be easier said than done, but it's really important and, as I said, actually facilitates and um, speeds up the process of problem solving. Um, and it also allows you to make changes in strategy faster because you're taking more ideas from different places simultaneously. You, you have fewer false starts. So I want to talk a bit about um, artificial intelligence. And, and we've had a few people mention it today, but what I'm interested in is actually, it's a great um, demonstrator um, as to what happens and what the impact of implic implicit bias is. So probably some of you have heard of Microsoft Tay. Um, there's a Twitter app that was developed in 2016, not too long ago, that, that was meant to have the voice of a teenage girl on Twitter, but using machine learning, it started to respond respond may have passed the Turing test, but the problem was that the responses started to accelerate into things that were, you know, racist, um, very hostile, sexist, etc. And uh, within 16 hours, they had to pull it because it was actually becoming a reputational liability to Microsoft. Um, but th that, that said, it, it shows that the data that is being used to actually fuel the, the AI that it's actually learning from is really, really important. Um, Facebook news feeds, the, the algorithms that we, you know, that fuel all the news that we're reading every day. What they do is reinforce almost our own implicit biases because you see something you like and it's just going to keep feeding you things that, that reinforce that. The problem is that means you're not being exposed to any other differing opinions. You may not agree with them, but it's important to know that they're out there. Now, if you bring that back into our own businesses, um, and Derek Mead of Motherboard, it's, it's an IT blog, actually said development and engineering teams that aren't built to be diverse enough to identify their blind spots in addressing users are inevitably going to misunderstand the, rea the reality of their users' experiences. 
at, at their peril. Um, and, and so one of the reasons that it's important to have that cognitive diversity around the board is it, again, actually helps you understand the customers and the people that you're trying to communicate with, the people you're trying to sell stuff to. So how is this all applicable to you and your own businesses? Um, part of it goes into HR and the hiring processes that people have talked about. Um, one of the things that, that we try to do is just part of the interview process is you, you ask people what their interests are outside of work. It's important that they, they have some. For <laughs> um, also ask, when was the last time that, that you had a question or a problem that you actually had to research? T tell me about it. it. I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day and the response is, well, I was sitting at my desk, I saw a weird spider uh, out the window, and I thought, oh, I've never seen that before. So I Googled it, looked for a few pictures, and, and that's, inter that's interesting to me. That, that tells me a bit about that person's thought process. Um, and it actually helps you then architect teams within your own business based around those, that cognitive diversity, those different viewpoints. Um, don't be afraid of conflict. I mean, obviously, you don't want a room full of people yelling at each other, but actually that creative tension is a good thing. It's, it's preferable to having a whole bunch of people around the table that just agree with each other. Um, and then make sure that all the voices within an organization um, can speak up and are heard. And the only way you can do that is through example, I've found. I mean, we, we, have, we have somebody running our customer services department who was a DJ in a previous life. Our head of sales literally was a rocket scientist. Um, our head of pre-sales was a carpenter. And now he writes electronic music on the side. Those guys, you get them all together in a room, the discussions you have can be mad sometimes, but the end result is inspirational. And it's important that we're willing to sort of take those risks and put ourselves out there as well. So thank you very much.